Chapter 18, The Professional Appraiser. So here we have some key concepts that go along with this chapter. And here we have our learning outcomes. So we're going to look at the five key elements to becoming a competent appraiser. Define the typical state requirements if you're going to be licensed or certified as an appraiser. Two major organizations of professional appraisers. We're going to outline the first two standards of the uniform standards of professional appraisal practice and also discuss the different positions that are available to appraisers once you obtain a license. Here we have the five key elements to becoming an appraiser. So the first element is education. There is specific coursework that you have to complete in order to get a license, and I'm going to talk about some of those different coursework and the different levels of that in just a few minutes. Also experience. Once you complete the first part of your education portion, you then have to go out into the field and get at least one year's worth of experience in order to be a fully licensed appraiser. So that experience is gained in the field. Now, obviously, as you're taking these continuing education courses, all of the education that goes along with appraisal, as you're doing more and more appraisals in the field, you're obtaining more and more knowledge. So you need to know all about the markets that you're working in, market data that's available, and the more you work, the more knowledge you obtain, obviously. Appraisers also need to have good judgment. So this is the ability to draw really good conclusions. And we're also looking for people who have integrity. So this is people who are morally sound, people who are honest, people who are fair, people who truly can provide an unbiased opinion. These are the different levels of licensing. So first they have listed here the trainee, and then you have a state license. You then have a certified residential license, and then you also can become a certified general appraiser. So there's four basic categories. You have to start out obviously as the trainee. Once you work for a year, you can then become licensed. Certified residential comes after that, which means that you can appraise properties of um, a higher value. And then certified general is the absolute top. I mean, this you can appraise anything if you're a certified general appraiser. This is showing you your basic education requirements and the number of hours that are required for each classification. So as a trainee, you have to do 75 hours. Now this is a little bit misleading because you also have to complete a USPAP course, which is an additional 15 hours. So in order to pass the trainee portion, it's actually 90 hours. Okay, so USPAP is not considered in this list. You then have licensed residential. So the number of hours that you have to complete for that is 150. Certified residential is 200 and then certified general is 300 hours of education. This is the appraisals qualification board. So the appraisal qualification board was requiring that you have some college semester credits in order to be licensed as an appraiser. Now, one of the things that I saw recently on the Georgia Real Estate Commission website is that they are no longer requiring this. So sometimes you hear that college semester credits are required in order to obtain a license and sometimes they're not. So the most recent information that I have is that they are not. We've talked about the hours of education requirements that you need. These are the hours of experience that you need. So once you pass all of the trainee, the initial coursework that you have to do, which is the 75 hours and then the 15 hours for USPAP, that's when you are then basically an apprentice underneath another appraiser for one full year. So it's 2000 hours of work. It's a one year time frame. And once you complete that, they sign off on all of the appraisals that you do in that time frame. Once that is complete, you are then what they are considered a licensed residential appraiser. In order to move to the next level, which is certified residential, you have to have 2,500 hours of experience. You have to complete that minimum two years. Certified residential is 3,000 hours, and the minimum amount of months there is going to be 30. These are two major organizations that a lot of appraisers are a part of. The first one is the American Society of Appraisers. Now, keep in mind, the, 
you're not just appraising real property all the time. There are appraisers that appraise other things too. So it, you could have an appraiser who is evaluating machinery, um, business valuations, real and personal property. You can have appraisers that appraise antiques, jewelry, gemstones. So there's lots of different types of appraisers that are out there. So the American Society of Appraisers covers all of those. We then have the Appraisal Institute. The Appraisal Institute was started in 1991. And in order to be a member of the Appraisal Institute, they do require that you have a college degree in order to obtain any of their designations. Here we have some specialized groups that you can also be a part of as an appraiser. We have the International Right-of-Way Association, the American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers, International Association of Assessing Officers, Association of Machinery and Equipment Appraisers, the National Association of Independent Fee Appraisers, and also the Institute of Business Appraisers. So there's lots of different professional groups that you can be a part of. Here we're going to do a little bit of a review of the USPAP ethics rules. Now we know that USPAP is used to help elevate the standards of real estate appraisers to better serve the public. So the first ethics rule here is conduct. Conduct requires that the appraiser perform all assignments ethically and competently in accordance with USPAP and that they do so with impartiality, objectivity, and independence. The second ethics rule is management. So management prohibits the payment of any undisclosed fees or commissions in connection with the procurement of an assignment. So accepting compensation for developing an opinion of value that is contingent upon the value conclusion, completely unethical. The third ethics rule here is confidentiality. So what you really need to remember about this is that you're only giving information about your appraisal report to your client or the intended users that your client states when they initially give you the request for appraisal. The last ethics rule is record keeping. So record keeping is all about making sure that you have really good files and that you're keeping all of that for the required amount of time. So they require that appraisers prepare and keep comprehensive work files for at least five years and any assignment where you have to testify in court as to the value of that property, you have to keep that work file for an additional two years after you testify. Here we have a couple of additional USPAP rules. The first one is the jurisdictional exception rule. If any part of USPAP is contrary to the law or any public policy in your particular jurisdiction, then you have to go with what the law says. So that is what the jurisdictional exception rule is. So this is the competency rule. The competency rule is really all about knowing what your limitations are. So as an appraiser, you're not going to accept work that you don't have the knowledge or the experience to perform. So if you don't feel that you can competently provide an adequate market value for whatever assignment you've been given, then you reject it and you let them give it to someone else. Okay, so if you guys are hearing noises in the background, my children are upstairs jumping around like monkeys. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> but <laughs> during this quarantine, we're doing what we have to do. And so if you're hearing noises in the background, it's, it's the four and six year olds in the house. All right, so next we have scope of work rule. So for each appraisal, <clears throat> appraisal review, appraisal consulting assignment, they have to complete the scope of work rule. And here's what it really is. Make sure you complete the appraisal. That's really all the scope of work is about. Make sure you identify the problem to be solved, figure out how you're going to come up with the value that you're looking for, and then disclose exactly how you came up with that value. So that's what the scope of work is all about. Making sure that your appraisal is complete and accurate. Now, if you remember, I've talked about all of the different standards that go along with uniform standards of professional appraisal practice. And I've also talked about the fact that it's not just real property appraisers. There's other types of appraisers that are out there in the world. So there's 10 standards in all. The first two standards apply to real property appraisal. So standard one, this is where you state the problem. 
In developing a real property appraisal, an appraiser must identify the problem to be solved, the scope of work necessary to solve the problem, and correctly complete the research and the analysis that's necessary to provide a credible appraisal. So standard one is all about stating the problem. So standard one states the problem. Standard two reports the results. So in reporting the results of a real property appraisal, an appraiser must communicate each analysis, opinion, and conclusion in a manner that is not misleading. So remember, all appraisal reports should be able to be read by a third grader, and the third grader should be able to understand what the appraiser was trying to say. Appraisers are required to be impartial in all of their evaluations. So we want to make sure that you don't, as an appraiser, have any type of undisclosed interest in the property that you're appraising. We want to make sure that the fee that you're charging for your appraisal is adequate and it's not contingent on a specific value of a specific property. And we also want to make sure that if you are receiving any type of referral fees, that all of that is disclosed and you're still objectively providing a market value for the property. There are several different ways that you can work as an appraiser. You can work as a fee appraiser, basically, where you get paid for every appraisal that you do. Or you could work for an organization that gives you appraisal assignments and then you get paid a salary. So there are several different ways that you can approach it. And um, a lot of people prefer working as a fee appraiser, um, but it really just depends on the type of work that you really see yourself doing. Here we have appraisers in institutional positions where you could work for a public company or maybe even a private institution that hires appraisers to do certain things. You could also work for the local government doing appraisals. You could work for specifically eminent domain cases. And then we also have the fee appraiser. So this is by assignment. So each assignment that you receive, you get paid a specific fee for that. So who wants to be an appraiser? There's a lot of individualized work that goes along with being an appraiser. So if you like to work independently, this might be a good position for you. If you like to work on your own and not around a lot of people, this would be a really good <laughs> profession for you. The work is varied. No two days are exactly the same. And um, you're not appraising the same properties each day, you know, so you're going out, you're in the field, you're doing your job at your own pace. You can do as many appraisals as you, as you want or as few appraisals as you want to do. And one of the things that's really good about this business is, is that even if there aren't a ton of people who are buying houses, if rates are low, people are still refinancing. So appraisers tend to have work pretty much all the time. Now, I mean, obviously there's going to be fluctuations, um, but it could be refinances that you're doing appraisals for. It could be new purchases that you're doing appraisals for, but you can sort of set your own schedule. And a lot of people like the freedom that goes along with that. So we've made it to the end of chapter 18, which is the last chapter in the book. So we've done it. Here's your summary for chapter 18. Becoming an independent appraiser or a competent appraiser requires many different skills. Besides pursuing a formal education, you also need to develop your knowledge of markets and real estate operations. This kind of knowledge is more often gained in the field than in the classroom. Having sound judgment is also an important skill for an appraiser. Developing good judgment usually comes with a combination of experiences in the field and education and most importantly, as a result of self-review. Integrity is also essential. Appraisers must be able to say no in order to succeed.